and welcome to Ladies Talking Business on Plus TV Africa. In the studio with me is Tade Fayomi. Tade is a consultant and a corporate riser. She started her career as a summer intern at Goldman Sachs, where she worked for eight years in New York, London, Singapore, and Dubai offices. Tade will be joining Boston Consulting Group soon. Thank you so much for joining me in the studio, Tade. Very glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm so excited you're here because, I mean, when it comes to your career trajectory, one would think you're probably 50 because <laughs> you've done so much within such a short time. I want you to tell us, just tell us about your story. Well, it wasn't um, planned, I have to say that. It was really just me starting off from when I was in university, really wanting to work hard to achieve what I thought I wanted to achieve, essentially. So even right from the first year of university, getting an internship on Wall Street and working my way up, networking with people, figuring out, oh, what does she do? What does he do? How can I do that? What do I need to do at school to get there? What do I need to do during the summer internships to get there? And that's really how it started. And that's how I was able to, like you say, build that career over those eight years, working at an investment bank, dabbling into a few different things before I realized that I love talking to people. I love working with clients. I also want to have exposure to the markets. I like the investment side. I found a role that kind of merged the two, which I thought were my strengths at the time. And I just took it from there, really. And that's how it, that's how it, all, it all happened. Um, promotions along the way, which was great. More exposure, more responsibilities. And um, yeah, that's pretty much my story, I have to say. So was it, when you say you were being very intentional, was it, did you already have it figured out, all planned out somewhere in your book, written down, <laughs> oh, this is what I'm going to do when I'm this, when I'm that? I mean, you started at age 18. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Well, it wasn't. I wish there was a book. If, there, if there's a book out there that can help me plan the next decade, that would be great. But it was literally, I got to school. I didn't know much about investment banking. My mom works in finance, so I had a little bit of an idea of the kinds of companies that were out there. And then at university, I, t I was told that this is what graduates want to do. They want to work at Wall Street. I looked at people who came back on campus to recruit, and I thought, I like what they do. I like who they are and what they represent. How can I do that? And so at the time, actually, my freshman year, it was a competition that one freshman would get an internship on Wall Street um, working at Goldman Sachs. And at the time, people, I think they wanted to go to the beach, go on nice summer holidays. <laughs> and I just thought to myself, this is gold. It's literally an opportunity that's ours to lose. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I got that first opportunity working in New York. It was like a dream at the time. I really enjoyed it. I worked hard, I have to say. And then after that, I could say, okay, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. And that's how I did two internships in New York, the last one in London. And then I decided that I wanted to move to London full time. I really liked the team that I interned with. And that's how I kicked off my career full time when I had graduated from university. And even then, while I was there, I would raise my hand for opportunities that came my way. And I really became the right hand woman to my managers at the time, which is why they were able to trust me and give me the kinds of roles that typically somebody at my level would not get. So when I was an analyst, I was easily doing the role of an associate. And by the time I was an associate, I was doing the roles of a vice president. And I think that's, you have to act for the job that you want. And they could tell, my managers could tell that I was doing it far beyond my current role and they should promote me and reward me and recognize what I was working on. So that's how it happened. <laughs> At the time, I wasn't thinking, be strategic, do this or do that. But it was me also thinking, okay, I'm sat here, there are 300 people around me. Do they know who, who I am? Do they have a good understanding of what I'm working on? What's my brand on the floor? And that's how I would go about doing that, from having coffees and lunches with people across the floor to volunteering and saying, oh, can I assist you with that? Or this is how we did it on the other team. And even reaching out outside of our office in terms of I would call Singapore and say, oh, I understand you have a client that's similar to ours. How were you able to do that? Could you please share best practices? And from there, they thought, oh, wow, there's this young woman in London <laughs> Who thinks you that made we a have? Presence. I made a yeah, exactly. That's how it happened, and that was it was through that network that I got the opportunity to actually work in Singapore, um, to work in Dubai as well. So it wasn't strategic at the time. It was me just doing my best, enjoying what Coming I'm doing. Coming out every time. You exactly, to. and it really paid. It it, it, re it rewarded me along the way. I mean, this is very inspiring. However, we find that these days, you see, I mean, it's not just these days, but it's been like that for a long time. You find a lot of young people being very confused mm. about what it is they want to do with their lives. Where are they getting it wrong? Where are they getting it wrong? Or are it wrong? they getting it? 
I don't think that gets me wrong. Because me too, I wasn't always as determined or very clear in terms of this is where I want to be at this given time. But at the same time, that's not an excuse to not do anything. And I think that's a little bit of the reason why some young people are where they're at, because they're looking for this dream job and they're not going to do something else in the meantime until they find it. I didn't know I was destined to work in asset management, advising clients on Japanese equities or bonds in Argentina, things like that. I had no idea when I was in university, but I knew I liked talking to people. I liked to give advice. I liked mentoring. That's something that I was involved in as well outside of my day-to-day, -day, so to speak. And that's how it just kind of went from there. And whatever I was doing, I did it to my best. I would give 110%, which is also something that when I talk to young people and advise them, because they might not like a particular role, then they zone off. They get to work and they're not really there. They're not present. But that's your current job. That's your current opportunity. You have to make the most of it. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be rewarded for that. At the same time, also, you have to constantly be networking and putting yourself out there. What's your brand? Who are you talking to? Who from your university, from your secondary school, even your primary school, can you reach out to to connect you to a better opportunity? But in the meantime, merely you have that conversation. They'll say, what are you working on now? And if you don't have anything to answer to that, it won't lead to the next thing because you mm -hmm. haven't built up a repertoire of things you've done well that can recommend you for the next role. So I think those are some of the reasons why some young people might be confused or not giving themselves the best opportunities to actually get what they want. All right, and then from all of the things you have said right now, I can tell that you're a very intentional person. <laughs> Where did you pick that skill up from? How did it all come about? I have to say it is a combination of things really. First and foremost, when I think about that, definitely from my parents. So my mom is a businesswoman, like I mentioned before, and my dad is more into history and politics, but both of them have built up strong careers over there while they were working. And especially my mom, who's quite tenacious, she always believes mm. that the worst that can happen is somebody says no. no. So why don't you put, your, put yourself out there? If they say no, if they don't respond to the email, that's fine, you move on. And I think that spirit has really helped me over time to make sure that I always do things as best as possible. And I put myself out there. I send an email. I say, I'm interested in doing that. Could I run that? I have an idea mm -hmm. for something. Sometimes they say, oh, that's great. And they never get back to you. And then for some of my ideas, they've said, oh, that's amazing. These are the resources you need. This is the budget you need. Why don't you do that? And that is a win-win for me and the company or whatever yeah. institution I'm working at. Mm -hmm. So I would say that has definitely influenced me and also my ambition because I know where I want to get to. And so that's what gives me the drive to keep going in terms of where do I want to be in two years, in five years, and what's required for me to get there. And so even when I'm tired, it's super late at night, I'm at work, but I know, Tade, this is where you want to go, this is what you need to do, and that keeps me going, that gives me that, um, that motivation. I feel like that's a very important conversation to have. Some people struggle with knowing what they want to do in the next two years three years, four years, so that clarity is very important. But we'll continue the conversation after this break. Okay. All right, we'll take a quick break now. You're still watching Ladies Talking Business on Plus TV Africa. All right, thank you for staying with us. We've been speaking with Tade Fayomi. Tadi, thank you for still being with us here in the studio. Thank All right, you. before we went on the break, we are having a conversation about um, how intentional you should be in terms of your career trajectory and the fact that people find it very difficult to set and outline these plans. How are you mm -hmm. able to successfully do this? So to successfully do this, and you mentioned even two-year, three-year plans, I think it's very important to have a vision. Where are you trying to get to? And what is practical in actually getting there? So we've all heard about SMART goals, but how many people actually take the time to make sure that where they're trying to be is something that they can achieve? So that's very clear. And I think also being honest with yourself about what your strengths and weaknesses are. That's something I've always known about myself is that I love talking to people. I love building relationships. Mm -hmm. And I've looked for jobs and opportunities that gives me the opportunity to put that in the limelight, so to speak, so that I can shine, I can do well, I can get rewarded for that, rather than 
willingly taking a job in things that I know I'm going to be challenged with, it's not going to work out so well. So I think that's really key as well as people make their plans and then also leveraging their network, their stakeholders, or what I call, like to call their personal board of directors. That's super, that's played a big part in my, mm. in my career trajectory as well. A lot of the opportunities I've had is because of the people that I've known along the way. And lastly, and help us understand before we move deep into it, help us understand when you say stakeholders, ideally these are names or terms that you use in the business world, right? Yeah. But then people don't understand that you can also have stakeholders as an individual. Exactly. Help us understand what that means. I mean, you are the CEO of yourself. You are of your, your business. Life. Of your life, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and so the stakeholders, I like to think of them as mentors, which everybody knows about. You have them at work or outside of work, sponsors as well, people who actually have the ability to take you from point A to point B and have invested into your career, as well as people who you admire. So there are some people on my board of directors who I've never actually even met in person, but I've seen them from afar, I've read their bios, I've looked at their own career trajectory, and I love what they do. I want to emulate them. For example, somebody like Mrs. Awashika, that's somebody where I know she's very popular in Nigeria. Whenever she has an event, I try to attend them because they are words of wisdom that I can apply to my life. And so she's influencing my career without her knowing it. So when I think about all those people, I write them out. I'm, very, I'm one of those people that I like to write things out because it keeps me focused. And then I know, okay, how often have I met with this person, with that person? Who do I need to update? Let them know that I want exposure into emerging markets. And then I speak to somebody, I schedule a call, they introduce me to somebody else. And then they start to make things work out for me. I can bounce ideas off of them. I can talk to them about my challenges. I can talk to them about my plans. And I think that's so important because honestly, we can't do this ourselves. No matter how Actually, much you think, yeah. I feel like the next most important um, thing we're here to do in life is to make adequate and proper connections with people, right? Definitely, definitely mm -hmm. so. And strong connections as well. Exactly. Yeah. Being very strategic about the kind of connections that you make. Well, one, while people would watch and say to themselves, oh my God, she's living a very perfect life. I know that <laughs> there's no one who has not made one mistake or the other in terms of their career trajectory and their growth and whatever successes they, are, you know, they have on their plate right now. So what are those mistakes that you'd say you've made along the way? Quite a few, actually, quite a few mistakes. Um, one of them that comes to mind that I made very early on in my career as well was when I was a new analyst working at the bank. I had built up a little bit of a relationship with the client over email. And so my manager at the time said, asked me to work on a massive spreadsheet. It was a request for new business. And I thought I knew what I was doing. And I did it really quickly and I sent it off to the client. And immediately after I hit the send button, I realized that I had put all of the numbers in thousands rather than millions. Oh my goodness. Exactly. Lose your job. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't lose my job. But there was that moment of, do I just pretend nothing has happened or do I own up to it immediately? And immediately, I mean, I wasn't that confident at the time, so I couldn't say it in front of everybody. But I'd asked him, could we please go into an office? And then I immediately told him, I've just looked back at the spreadsheets and I didn't notice that all of the numbers were supposed to be actual numbers. I've made a huge mistake. It was multiple tabs. And he laughed it off and said he'll call the client. And then the client, client said, that's all right. I know you're a new analyst. Everybody makes mistakes. Mm -hmm. But definitely it's things like that that have happened along the way. And because you're learning as well, right? And even later so on... Give yourself some room for mistakes. Give right? yourself some room for mistakes, definitely. And then also own up to them. Especially as a new joiner, the things that were put on me as the most important was accuracy. People oftentimes put speed as more important than accuracy, but it's important that your work is flawless because that allows you to build that reputation of somebody that they can rely on, not somebody where once they give you an email or a report, you have to check over it before it sends out. That just wastes time. That's something that I had to learn the hard way, a little bit embarrassing way as well. Um, but that was one of those big mistakes that really taught me that lesson. And even later on in my career, years later, another mistake or that I made over a period of time actually, when I had been working at the bank for, I think it was six years or so, I was looking okay. after a new region. I had stopped asking for help and support along the way. Because Why? I thought, I think I got very comfortable with what I was doing. I thought I knew this, I knew the game, I was in it for quite a while. I think that happens to a lot of people. I think that happens to a lot of people. And you kind of just become- um, Complacent kind complacent, of. Complacent, exactly. That's what happened. And before I realized that some of the mistakes I was making was just so classic. It was mm -hmm. the kinds of things that would happen to a woman who's trying to be more senior and thinks that she can do it all by herself and she actually needs some support. 
And so that was something that I realized that it came through through um, my performance review, one of the informal ones where my manager had said that I wasn't carrying myself as senior with some of these clients. Um, they kept on reaching out to him because they thought that he was the one looking after them rather than myself. And I realized that's something where if I had called my mentors at work, other senior women, they could easily have said, Tade, do this next time, do this, just to change the perception. Mm -hmm. So there have been quite a few mistakes along the way, but I just see them as an opportunity to grow. And once you make a mistake once, the chances of you making them again are very, very rare. Hopefully you learn from them. Yeah. Did you ever have issues where you had to rebrand yourself? So maybe you were allowing, putting yourself behind at some point and then at some other point you said to yourself, you know what, I need to be at the forefront of my game. Yes, definitely. That happened to me quite a bit. And I think it's something that happens to a lot of women. I was working very hard, like I said, and I wasn't telling people about the work I was doing. I was just at my desk, constantly my head down, typing away, working late at night, and people didn't know what I was doing. Whereas my counterparts, the typical alpha male, so to speak, they were leaving voicemails, calling people, walking into the MD's office to say, hey, this is what I worked on. I would think, why would you do that? But then I realized, actually, I was the one suffering for it. So I had to pause and re strategize what the game plan was. And I purposefully started setting up update meetings. So mm -hmm. with my manager, I said, even though you literally sit right across me, can we talk about what I'm working on on a weekly basis? Not that I wanted her to micromanage me, but I wanted her to know what I'm working on, my achievements. With the more senior people, I put in monthly and quarterly updates. Don't assume that they know. Don't assume that they know. And that really came around when it was time for promotions. Because mm -hmm. you just assume that they know that you want to be promoted. And when I finally sat down with my manager and I told her, I'm looking at making vice president by this point, she said, okay, I'm surprised, but let's work towards that. Why don't you tell my boss? And I thought, duh, wouldn't he guess that all of us here are trying to get promoted? <laughs> and when I finally told him, he said he didn't know. And I was in shock, but I was glad that I actually scheduled that meeting to say, I want to get promoted by the end of the year. We have 10 months. What can we do? Because it's a joint effort. It's not just me all of the stakeholders are involved in your promotion. And so that really helped. So that was something that I learned, thankfully, quite early on, that mm -hmm. as much as we put in a lot of um, emphasis on working hard, we also need to put emphasis on actually telling people what you're doing. So it's one hand to be networking with people. It's yes. another thing to actually be letting them know, this is what I did last quarter. This is what I did last year. This is what I plan to do next year. It's gone really well. I delivered X. We were able to grow the business by Y, things like that. All right, then we're going to take our next break, but then this has been a very interesting conversation. Definitely. All right, we're still speaking with Tade Fayomi. Please uh, take a quick break now to stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. We're still talking to Tade Fayomi. All right, Tadi, you are a management consultant. It's mm -hmm. a very, it sounds fancy. Is it really fancy? Is it easy? Is it difficult? If you love traveling around and spending time in nice hotels and many, many flights, maybe it would sound fancy, fancy. and attractive. Because <laughs> for a lot of people, that's why they're in it. But I think it's quite a tough job, to be honest. It's a lot of hours that are involved, but it's also a lot of very interesting work. Like I said, I like talking to people, I like helping them. And I thought to myself, what can I do to help businesses grow? That's what led me to consulting. And in terms of what was required, what I needed to do to actually get this job, I would say that you have to be very good at problem solving. So are you the type of person, for me, when I walk into a restaurant or an establishment, I'm always thinking to myself, how can we get under that table in here? How can this be more efficient? How can this be faster? That's what I'm curious about. What's the CEO doing right now? How can we have two branches of this? I'm just curious about how can businesses essentially do better? That's what drives me. And I think that's the kind of mindset that people have to have if they're interested in that. I'm not even looking forward to the traveling, to be honest. <laughs> um, trying to stay local as much as possible, but making sure that I'm still impacting my clients. Because for me, that's what's most important at the end of the day. That's what I enjoy doing. It goes back to what you really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know that you have other passions aside from consulting. Mm -hmm. yeah. How are you able to feed them with all of the many things you need to do at your job? I think it comes back to being intentional. So what I've done in this instance was between business school and when work starts, I put in... Meanwhile, well, congratulations oh, on your thank graduation you. at thank Inti. You. Um, thank you very much. I scheduled a six-month sabbatical for myself. 
Six which, months. Six months, yes. Which a lot of people might not have the time for. But I thought to myself, I'm passionate about working with women, working with businesses. If I don't put the time in my calendar to actually do that, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I was able to allocate that time towards it. And that's really given me a lot of time to spend with people who are working on startups, on new businesses, young women who want career advice, who have a lot of questions, who want to know how can they go about doing this or doing that. Because it's difficult if you say you're going to do but it. But do you do all of these things for free? Some of them. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of them. I um, mean, for the young people, you probably would want to do it for free, exactly, right? Exactly, yes. Yeah. So speaking at conferences and then follow-ups after that, people ask for my card, for my Instagram or my email address, whatever the case may be. Just and then in I have, case there's somebody that wants a free consulting service, what's uh, your Instagram account? <laughs> okay, it's um, at powerwomen.project. Okay. So that's my platform for basically working with young people and young businesses, so to speak, to help them grow. So um, maybe I was going to say feel free, but <laughs> DM me, visit the page and see if you'll be interested in that. But I really, again, it was coming down to being intentional. I made myself available. Mm -hmm. I, people approached me about speaking at different conferences and I said, this is the space I want to be in. There's no point saying I'm passionate about empowering women if I spend 30 minutes a month. Speaking to me, to it's them, more than yes. that. It's actually spending the time having them on my WhatsApp so that when they see a role, they can message me and say, Tati, what do you think about this? Do you have time mm -hmm. for a quick call? Mm -hmm. And I can actually make myself available to them. For businesses, it's a little bit more complicated, but at the same time, I make time over the weekends to sit down and say, okay, let me have a quick look at your pitch deck. What can we change? What's better here? Things like that. But those are things that I'm passionate about. I eventually want them to be my day job, so to speak. And if I don't actually spend enough time in it, exactly. the two are never going to merge. Yeah. All right, so um, how far would you say the average lady does in terms of climbing up the career ladder? Wow. Well, I don't have the stats on that. What I think for a woman at any stage in her career, there is a lot of, there's a lot of room for growth. Mm -hmm. We can definitely be better. And at the same time, I think that organizations and the men in the corporate world, they've started waking up to the fact that maybe there's not, there are not as many women that there needs to be. And some policies are changing, some mm -hmm. companies are shifting their attitudes, but there's still so much room to actually do more. But at the same time, women tend to be more they lack confidence compared to men. And so it's they themselves that are actually limiting themselves. Just like I mentioned earlier, when I compared me to my colleague, Matthew, at the time, Matthew was <laughs> all over the place. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, he just walks up to the MD's office. He signs up for things. And I think, how does he have the time to do this? He volunteers to do things. He's always talking, telling people what he's working on, even before he's actually gets and started. Whereas women, until you've done the job complete, before you actually tell your manager, until you check every box for the requirements before you apply. There are so many ways that we limit ourselves without even giving them the chance. So even though the company mm -hmm. might have given you the chance to succeed, your mind is doing that for you. It's limiting so you. You need to open your mind up as well. Exactly, yes. And we need to build our self-esteem, build our confidence. I think that's so important. And that's the reason why many people, many women, aren't as um, successful in the workplace as mm. they should. That's definitely one of the reasons, yeah. Um, and there's so many resources out there. So I love to read and listen to books. And from each one, either it's power posing where you do the super, have you heard of that? <laughs> where you do the Superman pose in a, in a corner before a meeting because apparently mm. scientifically it makes you more confident if you stand like Wonder Woman or Superman. Does that work? <laughs> it, it, there's a whole book about it. I think it's called Power Posing. But there are all these books that are coming mm -hmm, up now mm -hmm. and um, thought processes in terms of how we can build confidence, how we can communicate more eloquently, things like that to help because you. Because some women actually have these things, but they probably don't know how to communicate effectively. Exactly. It's, it's so key. I'm actually um, giving a presentation next week on communication to a group of um, entrepreneurs. Because especially if they are startups, they need funding. If you're not able to communicate your story to investors, you're not getting that funding, no matter how great the business model is. And it's so important. And if you've been from childhood in a home where you've been told to keep quiet until you're spoken to or you're mm -hmm. schooling, so many different factors are involved in terms of why we don't speak up. But we need to speak up. Every job at the end of the day comes to some element of sales. Mm -hmm. and selling yourself, your ideas. True. Uh, I think that's so important for success in the corporate world and beyond.
Uh, finally, before I let you go, what would your final advice be to those young people out there who really want to do something good with themselves in terms of their career trajectory? They don't just want to stay in one place 10, 15 years. Mm. Okay, my final pieces of advice, if I, if I may. Just give us all of them. Just, <laughs> just give them all of them. I would say research and prepare. Okay. Read, 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 be on the internet doing something productive and learn about what you're interested in and how you can get there. Like I said before, if it, that's even reading the bios of people, how do they get there 20 years forward and look to copy that, so to speak. Secondly, I would say is network, like we talked about earlier. You don't know who your friend's parents may be. You don't know who are the people at church or in your extracurricular activities that can actually be two or three degrees away from your dream job. And lastly, I would say work hard. There's no easy way out. Oftentimes, millennials are likened to people who are a little bit entitled. They don't want to work as hard. They feel our generation can be quite relaxed about these things. But at the end of the day, there's no good job that doesn't require you doing an excellent job. Mm -hmm. I think those would be my few um, pieces of advice for young people in starting up their careers. All right, great. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you me so much for having me. It's thank great you time. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, I hope you did have fun and then you learned one thing or two for your careers. Uh, if for more educative and informative conversations of this nature, do follow us on Plus TV Africa on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all on Plus TV Africa. I still remain your host, Irene Ubani. Until next time, bye.